it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, in person, finally, I think uh, I have never been here in this uh, this conference in person. So today, I would like to talk about uh, graph neural networks and uh, deep learning on graphs or on networks or, or network structured data, and from a particular perspective of uh, physical models. So I probably uh, all of our, uh, all of you have heard about graph neural networks and at Twitter, for example, we apply them to, to different types of graphs that, that we have at Twitter. So in general, if you look at these kind of architectures, so they are a particular case of what we call geometric deep learning. So this is a framework that allows to derive uh, most of the popular most of the popular deep learning architectures from uh, fundamental principles of symmetry and invariance. So a little bit in the spirit of the Erlangen program, if you're familiar with geometry in the 19th century, that, that was proposed by, uh, by Felix Klein. So in, um, in this framework, the idea is that you can think of your data as uh, data that lives on some geometric domain that is described by a symmetry group, like, for example, the plane or the two-dimensional grid with the translation group. And then you can derive from first principles the convolutional neural networks. In this case, convolution is what is called an equivariant operator that, uh, that is equivariant with respect to, to, to shifts in the data. So graph neural networks are another instance of this blueprint where uh, you have equivariance with respect to permutations. So, and it comes from the fact that uh, you don't have a canonical way of ordering the nodes in your graph, right? So any permutation of, of the node order can be, uh, can be allowed. So the standard paradigm of learning on graphs is what is called message passing. So you have a graph and you use the connectivity of the graph to propagate information. So the data is usually assumed to live in the nodes of the graph, like let's say uh, users of a social network. And then you look at the, uh, uh, at the, connect at the neighbors, social neighbors in this, uh, in this graph and you send information from the neighbors to, to every node. And by doing it several times, you can propagate information along the entire graph and uh, get uh, solve the task that, that, that you want to do. So um, in this sense, the graph plays a dual role. So it's part of the data, so the connectivity can reveal important uh, insights about your data set, but it's also a computational device. So uh, that's how you send information, right, along the graph. And um, there is a lot of uh, theoretical insights about uh, uh, this use of the graph as a computational device because uh, message passing neural networks are actually formally equivalent to what is called the weisfeld lemon graph isomorphism test. So it's a theoretical um, uh, uh, method in graph theory that, that is used to test whether two graphs are structurally equivalent. So for today's talk, I would like to, you know, to change completely the mindset and think of learning of, of graphs uh, through the physical metaphor. So we want to think of graph neural networks as discretizations of some continuous physical processes that, um, that, that can be described by systems of differential equations. So this is, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, such one such metaphor. So you have a, a mechanical system. So you have oscillators at every node of the graph that are coupled together by the, by the graph connectivity. And by uh, solving this system of equations and making uh, it have few learnable parameters, we can solve uh, tasks on, on graphs in a more efficient way. So the first uh, kind of um, type of processes that I would like to consider as this, learning, uh, as this metaphor for learning that comes from physics is diffusion equations. So if you think of propagation of information, so uh, mathematically it can be described by the diffusion equation. So this is uh, probably one of the physical processes that has been studied to death in mathematics and physics. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton himself in the, the 18th century first uh, came up with the mathematical formulation of this process. So this is the differential equation that governs it and probably you've seen it in the basic courses in partial differential equations. So it basically it tells you that the, the instantaneous change of some quantity, let's say temperature on certain domain is attributed to the heat flux, right? So the, basically the, the, the difference, local difference in the, in the temperature that, uh, that allows the, the, the thermal energy to, to, to flow. And there are multiple versions of this uh, diffusion equation, so it really depends on how the, uh, the domain on which you are solving it uh, conducts uh, heat, right? Or basically conducts any property that, 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 that you're considering for this diffusion. So, and we can distinguish between what is called homogeneous and isotropic diffusion, non-homogeneous diffusion, or anisotropic diffusion. So in the simplest case, the diffusion uh, properties are constant, right? So the, the heat propagates equally in every direction at every point, and then non-homogeneous uh, Diffusion means that it's position dependent, and anisotropic diffusion means that it's also dependent on direction. So these kind of equations were used in computer vision and image processing to do uh, image denoising and image filtering, because uh, 
if you think of diffusion, it's a kind of smoothing process, right? So the longer you run the diffusion, you will smooth out the noise from your image, but you will also destroy the, the discontinuities in the image that are important for visual perception, right? This is what you see in the center. So the idea uh, that was introduced in the 90s by Pietro Perone and Jitendra Malik was to make an adaptive diffusion, which you control locally. So you, uh, the, the, the diffusion speed depends on the uh, strength of the discontinuity right, uh, in, the, in the image. So you slow down the diffusion when you encounter an edge in the image, and this is the result that you get on the right. So it's uh, a nonlinear adaptive diffusion. And this is very similar, if you think of it, very similar to the mechanism of attention on graphs. And in fact, we can reproduce uh, uh, diffusion equations or something that formally looks like a diffusion equation on a graph where you replace continuous derivatives with uh, discrete derivatives. So the analogy of the gradient will be just the difference between the feature vectors at the two endpoints. The analogy of the diffusivity will be what we are typically, uh, we typically refer to as the attention function. And then the divergence, right? So it will be just aggregating information from uh, edges that, that uh, share a node. And uh, it is a nonlinear diffusion, so we can just discretize uh, the time with fixed steps and solve it numerically, so this is called the, the explicit or the forward Euler scheme, if you're familiar with numerical analysis. And uh, interestingly, it is uh, equivalent to the, the graph attention network, which is one of the popular architectures in this field, if you, uh, if you normalize it in a certain way and you discretize it with unit step size. So you can actually see that graph attention networks are a special discretization of uh, this diffusion equation. And of course, there, uh, there is a zillion of different numerical schemes how you can solve these equations that exist in the literature, uh, semi-implicit schemes, multi-step uh, schemes, uh, multi-grid schemes. And uh, you basically, you can think of it as uh, if you parameterize the diffusivity function, right? So uh, uh, this will be the, this will be the learnable parameters of your architecture. You start with some initial features on the graph. You diffuse them by this parametric diffusion, and you read out the results. So that will be the the, the output of your neural network. Uh, and this gives you a new perspective on uh, the learning problems because now you can leverage uh, vast literature from uh, from differential equations. For example, you can guarantee stability. You can guarantee convergence. Uh, you can also uh, exploit uh, some uh, more efficient solvers, such as uh, multi-scale or multi-grid solvers that, uh, for the time, at least have not been used uh, in, uh, uh, in machine learning uh, on graphs. Now, it is also, uh, as I hope to show you in the, re uh, the rest of the lecture, uh, it also provides interesting and deep links to other fields that are not explored well in uh, machine learning, which are, for example, algebraic uh, topology and differential geometry. So you can actually formulate uh, more exotic forms of the diffusion equation on uh, objects that, that are, come from these fields of pure mathematics, but they can be uh, uh, also interpreted um, uh, in a certain way as uh, new architectures for learning on graphs. So, um, so far, we consider this equation as uh, having continuous time, but the graph was discrete. What is uh, more interesting to see is to consider the graph as a discretization of some continuous object, right? So, and this has to do with the fact that the modern graph neural network architectures never stick to the input graph to propagate information. So you always do some form of graph rewiring. It can be in the form of uh, sampling your neighbors. It can be in the form of introducing some new virtual connections because some graphs happen to be uh, unfriendly for message passing. So we'll talk about it in, in a few minutes. But if I go back to the diffusion um, equation, let's say in the plane, uh, the way that you can discretize it really depends on uh, your numerical solver. So uh, if this is the second order differential operator that I have on the plane, uh, these are two, uh, three different discretizations, right? Or any convex combination of them will also be a valid uh, discretization. So what I'm trying to say that here, we also have a graph, right? When we solve it, these equations on the grid, but this graph can be chosen arbitrarily. So we want something like this for graph neural networks as well. We want to depart from the input graph and allow some flexibility in its, uh, in its choice for computational uh, reasons. And here again, we can go back to the um, works that have been done in image processing uh, about uh, three decades ago. Instead of considering the nonlinear diffusion equation, we can consider the non-Euclidean diffusion equation. And uh, again, if you think of images, which are grids, right, special case of, of graphs, you can consider an image as a surface or a manifold that is embedded in uh, a joint space where you have both the, the features, right, of the nodes, let's say the RGB colors, and the positional coordinates, which will be, in this case, the XY coordinates of the pixels, right? So you have a two-dimensional surface in five-dimensional space. Now, uh, in Riemannian geometry, once you have this embedding, you have a canonical Riemannian metric, so a way of locally measuring distances and angles, that is uh, uh, that you can pull back from uh, from this embedding, 
So without going into too much details of differential geometry, you can write uh, a diffusion equation with respect to this uh, uh, non-Euclidean structure. So this is called uh, the, the Beltrami flow. So it has uh, a non-Euclidean version of the Laplacian operator, right? These second order derivatives that we've seen in the diffusion equation, but now it has to, uh, um, to account for the curvature of the, of the underlying space. And uh, these kind of flows are encountered in, uh, in high energy physics, what is called the Polakov energy. So uh, they def describe uh, what physicists call bosonic strings. Now, uh, you can apply this equation to, uh, to images as well, and this was done uh, in the 90s. And uh, from this, you can derive a very general class of uh, uh, image filtering that are described by partial differential equations. So we can do the same thing on graphs. In this case, we have two types of data in every node of the graph. We have the features, right, like user information and social network. We also have positional coordinates. And positional coordinates here represent the uh, uh, embedding of the graph in some continuous space. So I can uh, take my graph and I can compute, for example, uh, its representation in a hyperbolic space, right, space with uh, hyperbolic uh, geometry or negative curvature. And now I uh, can apply this evolution equation to both components of these coordinates, to the features and to the positional coordinates. And the evolution of the features is the standard feature diffusion that we've seen before. But the evolution of the positional coordinates, you can consider them as graph rewiring. Because if I have two nodes that in this positional space come closer, I can create a new edge to facilitate the propagation of information. And on the other hand, if they drift apart, then I can cut an edge and uh, 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 make this, uh, basically, I, I can decide that this edge is redundant and doesn't contribute much to the flow of information. So I know that it sounds a little bit complicated, but uh, this is a picture that probably shows it uh, nicely. So this is a node classification task. We have the Cora graph here. So it's one of the small graphs that is used in, uh, to test graph neural networks. So the color of the node represents some low dimensional projection of the features. The positions of the circles represent some, again, low dimensional, two dimensional embedding of the graph. So the positional coordinates. And you see that the edges change on the fly. So when we evolve the graph, we get very nice clusters, both in the color and in the space. And the graph is changing on the fly. So that's a kind of more efficient graph neural network that changes the connectivity adaptively uh, th that is used for uh, propagation of information. Now, some of you may find this uh, kind of um, idea that, that you uh, do filtering on some domain, but this domain is changing under your feet, right, literally as you're, as you're evolving it, uh, disturbing, right? And this is not very common in signal processing, for example, or, uh, or machine learning, but it is quite common in differential geometry. So in differential geometry, uh, uh, you can take uh, a manifold, right, or a surface, and apply some evolution equation to it. And probably the most famous of these evolution equations are what is called Ricci flows. So you start with a manifold that, uh, that looks like this kind of a dumbbell, right? And you can apply a, a Ricci flow that evolves the Riemannian metric of this manifold. So when I talk about evolution of the surface, we are talking about Riemannian manifold. So, uh, so it, it's actually evolving its intrinsic structure, the metric. Now, you see that, at least uh, superficially, structurally, it looks very much like the diffusion equation. We have on the left-hand side the temporal derivative of the quantity, right, of the metric. On the right-hand side, we have what is called the Ricci curvature tensor, which is a second-order quantity a little bit similar to the Laplacian that we have in the diffusion equation. So, of course, in terms of the behavior, it's very different, but uh, you can think of it as a kind of diffusion of the, of the metric. Now, uh, what happens to a manifold like, that looks like a dumbbell when you run this, this kind of diffusion equation backwards in time, it becomes more sphere-like and then collapses into a point. And why this is important, and actually uh, the, the, uh, this uh, class of evolution equations were proposed by Richard Hamilton in the 80s uh, with one goal, to prove the Poincare conjecture. So this was a long-standing problem in topology that, uh, that said that you can describe high-dimensional spheres by the ability to take uh, in two dimensions, you can take a closed curve and collapse it into a point, right? So if you can do it uh, for every curve, then you're on a sphere. You cannot do it on a torus, right? So if you have a curve like this, then it's not collapsible into a point. So it was conjectured that this is true also to characterize uh, uh, high dimensional spheres. And it was uh, proven by, by Perelman in, uh, about 15 years ago that, uh, that this is indeed the case for three dimensional spheres. So this was a big breakthrough uh, uh, at that time. So you may ask, what does it have to do with learning on graphs? So in graphs, uh, I remind you that we use the graph to propagate information, and some graphs can be unfriendly. Actually, social networks, what is called uh, small, uh, small world graphs, right, or scale-free networks, tend to be unfriendly for message passing because their volume grows exponentially. So if I look at the number of my neighbors, uh, the neighbors of the, my neighbors of my neighbors, 
uh, in a social network, then it grows very fast, right? And uh, you can also, um, uh, usually it's formulated as a certain number of degrees of separation. So you can reach anyone in the social network with just a small number of hops. And if my task depends on, on uh, long distance uh, nodes, and I have this kind of uh, underlying structure, then uh, my learning is very inefficient because I have a phenomenon that is called over squashing. So I have a lot of information that I need to squeeze into a single feature vector. And uh, learning in this case is inefficient. So if you think of it mathematically, you can think of it as a kind of insensitivity. So I can look at the output of a multi-layer graph neural network and see how it depends on the input in a node that is far away from the node at which I'm uh, producing the output, right? So xi is the node of the output, xs is a node that is a few hops away uh, uh, in which the, the uh, input feature vector is given. And we see that we can bound actually this, uh, uh, this uh, output by the derivative, right, the Jacobian of the uh, output of the neural network with respect to the input. It is bounded well by the, the Lipschitz constant of, of the neural network itself, but also by the uh, by the, some power of the normalized adjustancy matrix. So the structure of the graph has to deal with it, but it's not very clear in what way. And we know that uh, there will be some cases that are worse than others. So for example, trees are pathological, right? So in case of trees, uh, actually this insensitivity is the, is, the, is the worst. In case of grids, for example, uh, we don't have these problems. So we need something that is more nuanced, something that would allow us to distinguish between something that looks like a grid and something that looks like a tree. And in differential geometry, that's exactly the notion of curvature. So curvature allows you to locally distinguish between things that look like a sphere or like a hyperbol hyperboloid or like a plane. And the way that you typically define it, what is called the Ricci curvature, you take two nearby points, you shoot geodesics from them, and you see whether they converge, uh, diverge, or remain parallel. Right? And you can define it as a number. So it's called curvature. And whether it's positive, that you have a sphere. If it's negative, you have a hyperbolic surface. If it's zero, you have something flat. So you can define a, a, a similar uh, quantity on the graph. You can take uh, two nodes connected by an edge and look if the edges that emanate from these nodes, they tend to form triangles. So you have clique-like structures. In this case, you can say that the curvature is, uh, is positive. If they tend to form rectangles, then you look at something that uh, is locally agreed. And it, it is flat. It has zero curvature. And if you have tree-like structures, so these, uh, uh, these uh, nodes diverge. Uh, then you have uh, negative curvature. And you can define uh, some discrete quantity for every edge of the graph, allow me to skip the details, that uh, counts triangles and rectangles and reproduces the behavior in the continuous case. So cliques are positively curved, grids are zero curved, and trees are negatively curved. Now with all these, we can prove a result, and again, uh, skip, skipping the details, that if you have a graph that has strongly negatively curved edges, then you have bottlenecks that contribute to this over squashing. So in other words, uh, it is negative curvature to blame for this uh, difficulty to propagate information on the graph. And once we know it, we can rewire the graph surgically by just removing these edges and replacing them with edges with bigger curvature. So typically, they will look like these kind of bottlenecks. And this allows us to significantly facilitate the propagation of information in the graph as a result improved learning without changing dramatically the graph structure. So you still want to, to, to stick to the original connectivity of the graph without uh, making uh, any disasters. And it's especially important, well, again, allow me to skip the, the details of that, in situations when your graph is what is called heterophilic, where your, your neighbors are dissimilar from you, which is very typical in social networks. So we might, uh, our friends might be similar in something to us, but very dissimilar uh, in, other, in other aspects. Now, I, I promised uh, some uh, algebraic topology, so here it is. Basically, if you think of a graph, a graph is purely topological object, right? Like a manifold. So roughly speaking, you have the notion of neighborhood, but you don't have a notion of distance or angle, right? So in order to introduce these notions, you need to introduce geometric constructions, which in the case of manifolds is introduced through a construction that is called an affine connection. So an affine connection, roughly speaking, tells you how you move vectors from one point to another on the manifold, right? Because manifold is locally Euclidean, so uh, you cannot add uh, two vectors, uh, two points on the manifold. You need to move one vector, vector to, another, to another point, and this is uh, done by uh, parallel transport. That is exactly described by the affine connection. If you have a Riemannian manifold, so the metric prescribes a unique connection that is called the levi civita connection. That is kind of canonical way of moving vectors. So if you go to graphs, you can define an analogy of this mechanism by, uh, by um, defining what is called a cellular sheaf. 
So you associate vector spaces with every uh, node and every edge of the graph. And then you have linear maps that take vectors from one node and move them to, from one vector space to another vector space. So this looks very similar to this uh, mechanism of parallel transport. Now, uh, this means that I'm not adding uh, two uh, feature vectors at uh, two endpoints of an edge. I need to subject it to some transformation. Uh, and you can define the analogy of differential operators that we've seen before in the diffusion equations uh, with this extra uh, complexity. And I can now study diffusion equations on the sheaf instead of the graph, right? So I lift the graph into this more complicated object where I have more structure, and I can ask questions, for example, if I restrict the class of transformations that I allow to, to subject my data to, uh, what kind of uh, uh, machine learning problems can I solve, for example? How many classes of nodes I can separate on this graph? And this is an interesting alternative to the standard way of analyzing the expressive power of graph neural networks using the vice Lehmann formalism that uh, makes an analogy to graph isomorphism testing and assumes that the graph that you use to propagate information is the same graph that is given as input. So the graph structure is discovered by working on it in some way. So here we can allow to rewire the graph because we are talking about differential equation. We can discretize it in different ways. And we studied the limit of this diffusion uh, uh, basically, we uh, allow diffusion to, to, to run for infinite time, and then we see whether we were able to separate uh, uh, certain classes of nodes or not. And uh, we can actually show that uh, this way we can be strictly more powerful than, than a traditional message passing that is equivalent to vice versa lemma. So I think I'm running out of time. So uh, let me just mention that I started with this image, so I would like to finish with it. You don't necessarily need to consider uh, diffusion equations as your underlying physical system. It can be other, uh, more interesting equations. So in this case, it's a wave type equation. So it has second order derivative, what is called the kinetic term. So basically it has both oscillations and dissipation. So you have both diffusion and oscillatory behavior. And for some problems uh, of learning on graphs, uh, wave equations are actually more adequately um, model the, the behavior. Like for example, if you want to compute shortest path. So the Dijkstra algorithm, you can think of it as a discrete version of the, of the wave equation or the, the, the iconal equation. And you can consider other, uh, uh, other types of equations, for example, quantum mechanical systems. So uh, this kind of uh, methods actually uh, uh, tend to work very well in um, computational chemistry problems where you, uh, you try to predict properties of molecules, for example, when you are screening or designing new drugs. So I, I will just finish with this question that uh, probably we need to go beyond the message passing paradigm. So it's not anymore message passing, at least in the traditional way that it is understood in graph neural networks. We can probably say that, that um, uh, we, we are already beyond this paradigm. So uh, we, we, don't, we, we still pass information between nodes, but we do it in more exotic and more creative ways. And in some cases, we can actually write closed form expressions for, uh, for the solutions of uh, these differential equations. So um, I will stop here. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.